everybody. Um, so and now it's for something completely different. I'm just here to try to tell you some updates uh, from the IPCC report that I was involved with uh, and that was published on April 4th. So we put years of work into these reports. Um, there's hundreds of us. I guess there's about a thousand scientists total working across all three working groups. And so um, I just want to tell you a bit of what's in there and uh, how it might interest you. So let's get right to it. Uh, oh yeah, and there's a clicker. Thank you. There we go. I can do that. Okay, so um, the, I'm going to focus on one specific aspect of the third working group, which is on climate mitigation, when a whole lot less becomes a whole lot more, the promise of low energy demand for climate mitigation. And you see that we're already into degrowth. Um, so this is a first, uh, first in the IPCC's history. The IPCC has been going for um, more than 30 years now. And so it's the first time that they allowed themselves to have a chapter on demand and energy demand and what, how we could think about it differently. And that is a huge opportunity and very late in coming. Honestly, they should have had it to start with. Um, but so you can see uh, that we finally got it done. And uh, the lead authors are um, Felix Kreutzig and Joyashri Roy. And you can see the team of authors. And I'm way down on the list on the people who helped out. But some of my research is, is included in this chapter. So I'm going to talk to you more about that. Um, and this is a big deal. And why is it a big deal? It's a big deal because this is really one of the headline messages to come out of this uh, six assessment report, which is that de the considering demand and reducing demand has the potential, can you still hear me, uh, to bring down global, I shouldn't mess with things, uh, has the potential to bring down global emissions by f uh, 40 to 70 percent by 2050. So considering demand is huge. Um, the solutions are not going to be surprising to anybody. We're talking about walking cycling instead of car use, electrified transport, reducing air travel, adapting houses, um, also plant-based diets uh, are very important. Lifestyle changes require systemic changes acro across all of society. This is a very important point. Um, in the past panel, I did hear, overhear something about behavior change and motivating behavior change. Demand and behavior change are not the same thing. If you want people to reduce their energy demand and their demand for polluting and uh, damaging consumption practices, you have to give them a context that allows that, that, those practices to change. So lifestyle changes require systemic changes, and this is something that the IPCC report talks about as well. And some people require, and some people, in fact, some countries, require additional, additional capacity, energy, and resources uh, in order to focus on human well-being. So this is a huge departure, and I don't think that it's been reported upon enough, and that's one of the reasons I'm really sort of motivated to just come back and keep talking about it. Um, this is the first time that we have an IPCC report that doesn't just focus on the, require, the resource requirements of economic growth, but on the resource requirements of humans. Again, you would have thought that that might have been a priority 30 years ago. Sadly, better late than never, I hope. Um, so these are some of the scenarios that are shown on the that have been included in the report. You can see that they go to sort of horrific levels of warming way above four degrees. Sadly, we're headed for 3.2 degrees. That's something else that the report confirmed. And um, we have uh, some scenarios that keep us within 1.5 degrees. Most of those scenarios, sadly, uh, rely on speculative, unproven, and probably non-functional technology involving uh, negative emissions. So. Let's forget those. But some of the scenarios managed to get us to 1.5 degrees or close without doing that kind of stuff. And they happen to be low demand scenarios. And I'm just pointing out this graph to show that they do exist. So we do have some scenarios that have lower demand, especially for countries in the global north. And they're the ones that sort of bring us to, into safer temperature ranges. Um, so this is a core plot, and usually it's messed up on projectors, but this is EPFL, so you have high quality projectors. It's good. Okay, I'm just gonna tell you a few things about it. It's kind of cool. So we'll look over here. Most of you over here, sorry. Uh, so, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> 
the, so the, this gray bar uh, that you see on each plot would, is sort of the, em the emissions without demand reductions. So sort of the emissions on business as usual trajectories. And then the bars, the blue, red, and yellow bars are actually the emissions you, that you get reduced by taking into account demand reductions. And the demand reductions fall under different categories of actions of, or of interventions. So this is a plot from the Summary for Policymakers. It's figure SPM6. And I think it's really one of the most important pieces of work we, we managed to get, in this, get done in this report. Because you, you see that the factors change depending on different sectors. So for instance, in nutrition, there's a huge impact that you can have in terms of reducing emissions thanks to nutrition demand changes. And those are mostly socio sociocultural factors involved in moving to plant-based diets. But then for other sectors, the picture is very different. So you have industry, land, buildings, uh, uh, so, um, industry, transport, and buildings. And you can see here that the blue part, for instance, for transport and buildings, is much, much smaller. So here, this is really getting to this point that we're not talking about behavior change. We're talking about creating the infrastructure and facilitating conditions that allow people to live um, uh, lives, have good lives at lower energy use. And so the red part is infrastructure change, and the yellow part is technology change. And I think that this is a really helpful way to sort of show the challenge ahead of us and what needs to be done and what needs to be invested in. And so I, uh, I really think that this is a a really important contribution that I hope you'll be able to engage with. Um, and I think I'm going to skip this one because I have it twice, if I remember things correctly. Um, so this is a quote from chapter five, um, which has to do with the participatory and citizen nature of climate action and reducing demand. So, you know, and again, we have the IPCC really engaging with this topic of resource use for well-being. So to enhance well-being, people demand services and not primary energy and physical resources per se. Focusing on demand for services and the different social and political roles people play broadens the participation in climate action. So basically saying this idea of reducing demand and providing the circumstances for people to live good lives at low demand means that we can broaden citizen participation. And I think that that's quite important and promising. Um, so this is the part where I sort of turn into a teacher. When you think of energy systems, what we're really wanting to think about is services, energy services. This is a plot that was from the, world, the 2000 World Energy Assessment. Um, I think you, uh, Professor Joachim was at ETH Zurich, and he did this chapter. And so it basically gives this picture of energy from primary extraction, all these different, you know, transformation stages, the final energy level, which is kind of a random because it just, it's just an economic category. It's not actually a technical category. It's when it's sold to the final user. And the useful stuff is what you want. It's the use after final conversion. And here's the problem. Fossil fuel supply chains are particularly awfully wasteful. So for most uses of energy, fossil fuels lose half to two thirds of the energy contained from primary to useful. And in the end, all we want are services spelled correctly, um, which include comfort, illumination, communication, mobility, and access. And those things you might not even need energy for at all. So when we're thinking about energy systems from the perspective of the well-being of the end user, we're talking about energy services and not primary energy. Um, when we think about what services are required for well-being, this is where um, my colleague Narasimha Rao at Yale University has been doing some fantastic work uh, coming up with his theory of decent living standards, which include the material and energy services required for well-being. And um, so that, that research gives us a good basis to do some modeling work. And so we did the first uh, global model. So on the basis of his work, we did the first global model of what is the energy, minimum energy required for universal well-being or universal decent living standards. Um, so our model takes a whole bunch of things into account. Um, you won't have time to read this. It's kind of fun. It has a whole bunch of different things. Um, it has a whole section on does this mean going back to into, living back into caves? Uh, the answer is really posh caves, yes. And, uh, and you can see that it has a whole lot of technology in it that is included that has both direct energy and uh, embodied energy, as well as infrastructure, public and private consumption. And long story short, um, this is the kind of trajectory that we're on in terms of global final energy use. The International Energy Agency believes that we're just going to keep 
growing our energy use, they're probably right, um, but we don't have to. These are some other scenarios where you, they try to take climate into account. There was a previous model by Arnold Grudenbler on low energy demand that got us somewhere here around 250 exajoules. And our model gets us down to about 150 exajoules. So the total energy required for decent living standards, but not more, so no overconsumption, for every single person on planet Earth in 2050 is less than half what we are currently consuming. And that's um, an interesting thing to at least know is technically possible. This is based on existing technology or current technology trends that are realistic until 2050. There's nothing fictional about it. Um, uh, a similar or related piece of work by Yarmo Kikstra, which I also recommend that came out last year, shows what it would take in terms of investment. So we're talking about changing infrastructure and technology. That means we have a huge investment to make. What is the, what is the equivalent of that investment effort in terms of region and um, so where, do, where does it need to happen regionally? You can see the different regions in this plot and how much would it be in terms of this investment to allow everybody to live well at lower energy consumption. And you can see that the investment is considerable. It's on the same order of magnitude as one year of energy use globally. And um, one of the things that's, uh, and then they find the same sort of results as us in terms of what the annual energy use thereafter would be. One of the things you can see is that the investment necessary is in the shelter sector, so buildings. Um, once you make that investment, shelter becomes a much smaller part of your annual, annual energy pie. So you can really see you need investment in one place to get the benefit of not having to use energy in the future. And you can see that mobility continues to be a very large sector uh, going into the future. Um, we also did a study which ended up um, being part of uh, or recognized within the IPCC report quoted, quoted there on what were the socio, what are the socioeconomic factors that we can observe. This is empirical work um, that allow us to live well with less. And the positive factors are public services, equality of income, democratic quality, electricity access, that kind of thing. And negative factors are extractivism and economic growth above a moderate income. And this is not me wanting to say this, this is falling out of the data. If you had the same data set using similar methods, you would find exactly the same thing. This is, there's nothing about opinion here. So um, it really tells us about the kind of society that we would need to be going towards if we want to reduce emissions and reduce energy demand and allow people to live well in those circumstances. And I think there's really this trade-off between overconsumption and public services. So public services are something that sort of cuts across what we're providing for people. We're providing people with the infrastructure and the public services they need to live well at lower energy use. Um, and I think I will just leave it there, even though there's still a minute to go. That's a minute more for your coffee break. Thank you so much. Well, before coffee break, we should take some questions. Oh. So thank you all for participating. I do see your questions live as they come in. Feel free to drop them in as well right now. But we're going to kick it off with maybe one or two questions that came in now. So who holds the power when it comes to fighting climate change? International, national governments, corporations, or individuals? Um. <sighs> Right, this is where I go into a tirade about the Energy Charter Treaty. Um, we're learning more and more about international constraints to climate mitigation and the fact that they've been effective at stopping government, national government action for decades. And so if you've never heard about the Energy Charter Treaty, I recommend that you do so now. Switzerland is a part of it, so are most EU countries. It basically allows fossil fuel companies to have their investments and expectations of profit protected for decades into the future and they can sue national governments and win under arbitration, which is this very non-transparent sort of legal way to coerce a national government to pay damages. Um, and uh, this has been happening to Italy, to, to the Netherlands, to the UK. A lot of the companies creating the litigation are based in Switzerland. So they are based in Switzerland and then suing um, other countries around us for doing too much on climate. And so I think that's something that we should be paying a lot more attention to. It's been going on, but people have not been really sort of, it happens in such sort of a, um, an arcane structure of this uh, international treaty. And it's, uh, it's um, 
arbitration process that, you know, everybody, as soon as you say international treaty and arbitration process, I mean, I'm assuming you're all asleep by now, but it's actually really important and it's really a counter democracy, citizen action, and anything else that anybody is trying to do. So I think we should be paying a lot more attention to um, exploding this particular treaty. We can't just leave it because it has a sunset clause of 20 years. So it's still in effect 20 years from now, which is an ample time to destroy any chance we have at remaining below two degrees. Your last slide got a lot of, I had a lot of questions about that. And I also see a lot of questions here about it. Like what is moderate income, for example, because you yeah. said consumption above. So I want to go with some of these questions. There's yeah. a bunch of them. So we'll try to get as many as we can in a few minutes here. The big one, the overarching question is, how do you stay competitive if it seems to be at odds with sustainability? It almost seems like you have one or the other. Either companies and individuals and countries are competitive at the cost of sustainability, or they choose sustainability, but they lose competitive edge. Is it a one or the other? It depends what the... So, so here we're talking about structures uh, that are imposed by um, the kinds of economies that we have made. So there's no rule that says that our economies have to be this way, we can change them. And so this question of what we're competing for or what competitiveness means, I think is something that we need to rethink in the light of a more democratic economic system. And the question should be, what are the th kinds of activities that we want to foster that are most beneficial? And those should be the ones that have a competitive edge. Um, so it might not be possible, I personally believe it's not possible within existing structures to have an economy that uh, proceeds sustainably. I don't believe that um, you know, cutthroat comp competition allowing vested interests to have as much power as they currently do. For instance, the fossil fuel companies that basically made an international treaty that everybody then signed up to um, is, is, a, is a way that we're going to be able to achieve sustainability. I think we need to shake things up a lot more. I would say that the um, scientific consensus is agreement with me to the extent that both the IPCC and the, its equivalent in biodiversity terms are now openly calling not for transitions, which are sort of smooth little things, but uh, transformations of our socioeconomic systems. So I would be thinking a lot more about what that transformation looks like and how to be aligned with that. Do you think the Global North is ready to step down the continuous growth trajectory in order to reach the necessary goals? I think a lot of people within the Global North are. I think that the people who benefit within the Global North are, again, uh, from this kind of extractive sort of neo-colonial patterns are um, minority, and uh, that everybody else can be living perfectly good lives at much, much lower energy use levels. So we're, again, we're, we're really talking about the role of inequality here as well. When will we stop using carrots and become much more severe with climate change policies? I don't know, because one of the, one of the problems like, that I just, I mean, I, I, I hate to be talking about the Energy Charter Treaty so much, but it's just, even in the last couple of weeks, we've just learned so much more about it. We, our governments are not allowed to impose sticks because of this treaty. So carrots and sticks are nice, but right now we're just being stopped from having any uh, relevant action whatsoever. And I think that anybody in Switzerland should be caring a lot about this because the companies that are using this treaty are to a large extent here. Final question. What is the number one priority according to you? Um, please care about this stuff and please um, act like you can do something about it because you really can. But if you think that somebody else has this covered, that a bunch of climate scientists or biodiversity scientists or you know, desperate 15-year-olds for a while, they were sort of the people who were supposed to uh, do, do all the work for us. Like if, if you think that anybody else is going to be doing this work, rest assured that's not the case. So either we all step up or we're all going to reap the consequences. And if you don't know what to do, that's something that you need to figure out. Um, we can't do all the homework here.